Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've had a fun, full day of NUSA workshops. We're glad to have you here and looking forward to ending our day strong. My name is Ruth Aussie. I'm with the City of Fort Worth Community Engagement Office, and I'm going to be your host during this workshop. Um, before we start, just want to point out all the ways you can share your feedback. Uh, first, on the right hand side, you'll see that there is a chat room. This is the perfect way to say hello. Um, give a shout out to your presenters, introduce yourself, make comments you want everyone to see, and share any additional resources you have about the topic of today's workshop. Next, underneath that, um, we have a questions tab during the presentation. If you have a specific question you'd like to ask, write it here. Once the presentation is over, I will go back to the list and read those off. And we will do our best to respond to all your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, next, you will see the people tab. If you see someone making a comment that you really like or you want to connect with them, please make sure that you click on their name and you can send them a message um, so that you can chat later. And lastly, um, under the files tab, there is a presentation and it's a copy of this uh, workshop that we're having today. So feel free to download it and follow along or just download it after um, the presentation is concluded. So I want to introduce to you Justin Newhart and Jerry Tracy, and they're with the um, City of Fort Worth, and they're presenting on neighborhood revitalization through preservation, design, and advocacy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Justin Newhart, and I'm the Historic Preservation Officer for the City of Fort Worth. And joining me today are Jerry Tracy, the Executive Director of Historic Fort Worth Inc., which is Fort Worth's preservation nonprofit and uh, main advocacy organization. And um, hopefully Laura Voltman will join us um, later in the presentation. She's our senior planner over our uh, design and form-based code districts in the city. And today we're gonna be discussing the best ways to utilize and leverage the tools of preservation, design, and advocacy to revitalize historic neighborhoods and commercial districts um, through the use of best preservation practices, design guidelines, financial incentives, and advocacy. And we'll share some examples of how we've done that in Fort Worth over the last, um, last uh, several years to achieve um, positive results on the ground. So uh, historic neighborhoods and commercial districts throughout Fort Worth have seen a resurgence in the last 20 years. And this resurgence can be attributed to a few things, um, such as uh, city policies, a historic preservation program, and design districts, as well as community advocacy efforts on the part of local residents, nonprofits, and neighborhood, or neighborhood organizations. Historic and design districts in Fort Worth started out as community-led efforts to protect the resources that were most important to our residents um, in order to guide compatible development and reinforce those important characteristics um, in the neighborhoods throughout the city that people um, found most important to them. In regards to preservation, community advocacy helped to create the city's preservation program in the 1980s, uh, the city's first preservation ordinance in 1986, um, and in regards to design districts, that advocacy effort was led by local business owners, residents, and institutions in downtown um, and the near south side starting in the early to mid-1990s. Soon after Fort Worth created its preservation program in the 1980s, it joined the Texas Historical Commission Certified Local Government Program, or, a, or the CLG program, this has been one of the most effective tools for Fort Worth and our preservation program over the last um, 30 plus years. It is a state, local, and federal government partnership that empowers local communities to better protect historic resources by identifying local priorities, uh, meeting recognized historic preservation standards, and providing access to financial and technical services to further the identification, evaluation, designation, and protection of buildings, sites, uh, district structures, and cultural objects. Uh, local governments that participate in the program act independently to develop and maintain a successful preservation program. The Texas Historical Commission administers the program at the state level 
And the National Park Service is the um, responsible federal agency. Uh, the benefits of participating and becoming a CLG program are, um, amongst other things, technical assistance from um, uh, CLG program staff, uh, a network of local preservation commissioners and historic preservation officers from around the state, um, workshops and other training specific to local preservation challenges. And um, they do have an annual grant program um, that uh, helps fund local preservation projects throughout the state. Um, it, participation in the CLG program has been a key cornerstone for Fort Worth's preservation program for the past 35 years. It has allowed us to access critical preservation knowledge and resources, resources and leverage them to promote positive outcomes in our community. As an example, uh, we are currently taking advantage of a matching grant from the Texas Historical Commission to update our historic resource survey, uh, which is a key component of making informed land use decisions throughout the city. So after several years of participating in the CLG program, preservation leaders like Jerry and Historic Fort Worth um, throughout the city came together and decided that a preservation plan was needed to define clear goals and parameters for our preservation program. And in 2003, um, those groups and community leaders and preservation gatekeepers came together to create a plan that analyzed existing conditions on the ground within Fort Worth, identified threats to preservation and created a list of achievable opportunities and goals that the city and community groups could partner together to achieve. As an example, um, one of the goals from the preservation plan was that the city should work with community leaders to develop administrative regulations for the review of city-sponsored infrastructure projects and in order to protect potential historic resources such as um, bridges, street tile markers, um, historic boulevards like Camp Bowie, um, and other, area, other infrastructure throughout the city that um, may have been historic in nature, but weren't designated. Um, we found here in Fort Worth that a preservation plan is a city's best opportunity to bring everyone together, to celebrate accomplishments, um, refresh our community goals for preservation throughout the city, and set new objectives for the future. A major benefit of participating in the CLG program is that um, neighborhood organizations and community groups have also been able to access resources for best preservation practices um, that they can implement on the ground in their own neighborhoods and communities. Fort Worth has a limited amount of preservation staff in relation to the amount of historic properties that we regulate throughout the city. Uh, we are the second largest preservation program in the state of Texas. And we rely a lot on our neighborhood organizations to be our eyes, ears, and educators on the ground to help property owners develop projects that are consistent with preservation best practices. And this symbiotic relationship helps property owners and neighborhood groups buy into the preservation program because they are also responsible for managing compatible change within our historic districts. Um, one of the ways we are looking to increase community buy-in and the preservation program in the future is through the development of a um, survey tool app for your phone or iPad that can be used by neighborhood residents and community members uh, to help help us with our future resurvey efforts. Um, so all you need, all you would need, is a phone to go out in the field um, and help collect data on historic resources within our within our historic districts, um, and that kind of community collaboration on a project that big is really important, um, especially because it's going to take many, many years for us to fully resurvey re the entire city. Um, so we think this tool will uh, be extremely beneficial to our work in Fort Worth to make sound land use decisions and um, also create better community buy-in in our preservation program. Um, creating community buy-in is also especially important with regards to uh, preservation standards and guidelines. All of Fort Worth's district standards and guidelines are developed in partnership between the city and district residents. 
with the caveat that the standards and guidelines must meet the federal Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties, which is required by our um, CLG agreement with the state of Texas. And here on this slide, you can see a little snippet from the Fairmount District standards and guidelines, which gives you tips on how to appropriately design a um, new construction building within a historic context. Um, and our, our office has worked closely with the neighborhood organizations that created these historic districts to make sure that each district standards and guidelines are contextualized um, for, for that particular neighborhood. Um, so for example, the Fairmount District standards and guidelines that you see here are similar, but different than the guidelines for historic Carver Heights on the east side of Fort Worth, because each neighborhood was developed at a different time in response to different development themes and pressures. Um, so we think it's really important to have very clear standards and guidelines um, for each historic district. And those are really the best way to help implement preservation, uh, best preservation practices in historic districts and neighborhoods to help maintain that community character and heritage that's so important to residents uh, when they move into the, those areas. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Jerry to discuss how to use grassroots advocacy and partnerships to attain community goals. All right. Thank you, Justin. <clears throat> uh, well, it's a pleasure to speak to you about what a 501c3 charity does in the world of preservation. We certainly don't do what government does, but we respect and work with government at all levels. So you'll hear that through this presentation. Your city's going to be different than ours, and if if as you hear the names and titles of those who came to the forefront at various times in this city uh, to make preservation happen on the nonprofit side, think about the types of similar groups you have in your city if you want to continue to advance preservation on the charitable side. So. Um, as the action-oriented uh, preservation movement began in Fort Worth back in 1924 with a marker program during the city's 60th anniversary, other groups at the same time were making important contributions to preservation, like the documentation and preservation of local history by the Old Settlers and Historical Society that started in 1897 that is still alive today is the Tarrant County Historical Society. Additionally, the Friends of Van Zandt Cottage, and that cottage is about, was built about 1850, and it's comprised, the Friends are mainly family members, and a few others who just love that particular building, and it's Fort Worth's oldest building in its original site. So they are still here today. And then in 1972, the Black Historical and Genealogical Society was established to collect, document, and preserve landmarks and records of Fort Worth's African-American community heritage. Um, in 1975, the demolition of Niles City Town Hall led the, to the formulation of the North Fort Worth Historical Society, which also continues today. So there are lots of efforts in the past that are moving forward today simultaneously. However, the advocacy movement really revved up in Fort Worth in the 1960s when residential zoning was changed to commercial zoning uh, to expand our downtown. The neighborhood sacrificed in this plan was known as Quality Hill with no local preservation ordinance to protect properties until the 1980s, Quality Hill, Fort Worth's version of Charleston, was literally a sitting duck for demolition and people were not happy, that resonated. The residences of Quality Hill were designed to, uh, by prominent architects of the day and constructed primarily of stone and brick. Many reflected European revival styles with ornate columns, wraparound porches, grand terraces, roofs of tile and slate, portico shares, turrets, spires, carriage houses, pergolas, and lush gardens. They were amazing properties. They were owned by cattle barons, bankers, attorneys, and business entrepreneurs. As was typical in other parts of the country, women often led the preservation movement. 
which also happened in Fort Worth. With no preservation ordinance, owning a property was the best way to save your building. Some properties were bequeathed to an entity the owner trusted, as was done for the Fort Worth Women's Club on Pennsylvania Avenue. And some residences were purchased by preservation-minded owners for commercial or public use. It was in the late 1960s that the Junior League of Fort Worth began to work with the Texas Historical Commission, flipping back to government again, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation, a 501c3 charity, on methods to stop de demolition. The league brought in national preservation speakers to address their membership and the greater community, including the Chamber of Commerce. Recognizing that very few people know the different types of architectural styles, the league developed and delivered slideshow presentations in a group interested, any group interested in learning about what they called the art of the city. Then from 1969 to 70, the league hired Drury Blake Alexander, a distinguished preservation-minded architectural history professor at the University of Texas, to conduct Fort Worth's first survey of significant buildings. Mr. Alexander's work identified 14 high-style buildings prioritized for preservation. And with advice from the staff of the Texas Historical Commission, the Junior League development pla developed placements for their volunteers to write recorded Texas Historic Landmark nominations for the Alexander identified properties. This work led to state designations of the Flatiron Building and the Santa Fe Depot, both in the 1970s. Simultaneously, the Junior League of Fort Worth realized that the mission of preservation was so big, it required a dedicated preservation organization with equal gifts, and so with equal gifts of 25,000 from the Junior League and the Amon Carter Foundation, Historic Fort Worth was established. And the league gave the Alexander survey back to Historic Fort Worth for its continued service, uh, stewardship. One of Historic Fort Worth's first steps was to buy the house next door uh, to the offices of Historic Fort Worth today. That house is called the Pollock Caps House, and it is also part of Quality Hill. And that purchase was made in 71. The Historic Fort Worth Board placed a term easement on the property to keep it from being demolished by a different owner in the future. In 1972, Historic Fort Worth commissioned a historic building survey for the Pollock Caps House and sold the property to a group of trusted investors with this deed covenant on it. In 1973, six women, all junior league members, uh, stood literally stood up in front of the bulldozer to save the Wagner Wharton Scott building that we call Thistle Hill today, which was also in Quality Hill. They raised funds from private and public sources, including school children and a campaign known as Save the Scott and bought the mansion in 1976. In a special arrangement prior to any local preservation ordinance, Thistle Hill became Fort Worth's first local landmark in 1976. And it was already on the National Register at that time and became a recorded Texas historic landmark in 1977. Today, Thistle Hill is one of the two stewardship properties owned by um, Historic Fort Worth. In 1978, the league uh, considered purchasing McFarland House for their first headquarters. Its sole occupant, Caroline Edelman McFarland, had just died at the age of 100. The house was included in the Alexander survey and identified in the most, as the most significant Queen Anne residence in the region. Funds for the league to purchase the house were raised from many sources, including a gift of 50,000 from Historic Fort Worth, which the league had started several years earlier. And, um, and so in 1980, McFarland House became the city's second landmark. The Junior League did not stop there. In 1977, they focused on preserving the historic resources in other Tarrant County municipalities and researched the possibility of an association of preservation groups. They engaged the National Trust for Historic Preservation to hold a preservation workshop for Tarrant County that included the city of Fort Worth, can't do it without them, Thistle Hill, 
uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the Tarrant County Historical Commission, and the Texas Historical Commission. The resulting organization was the Historic Preservation Council for Tarrant County, established in 1979. HPC's legacy was its survey books that you're hearing about more updates today of the county's historic resources, collectively known as the Tarrant County Historic Resources Survey. HPC raised the funds to hire Paige Anderson and Turnbill of San Francisco to lead local volunteers to work on the project between 1983 and 1990. In 1995, the National Preservation Conference was held in Fort Worth, which had required a year of preparation for all the preservation groups working together to develop the tours, lectures, and educational sessions for the nationwide participants. An outgrowth of the conference was the desire to, for more preservation to be consolidated. So in 1998, the Historic Preservation Council voted to merge with Historic Fort Worth. HPC dissolved their corporation and gave Historic Fort Worth their survey files, photos, and records. Many on the board of HPC became board members of Historic Fort Worth. A preservation resource center compri comprised of resources from surveys and books collected this way and other ways was established in Historic Fort Worth headquarters. Um, and then all of it was consolidated and moved to another building that was owned by Historic Fort Worth on Summit Avenue, also in Quality Hill. Previously in 1984, um, the uh, league gave McFarland House to Historic Fort Worth for an entity exclusively focused on preservation to manage and restore the property. The league continued to office at McFarland until 2004 when they moved to a much larger headquarters. The highest profile advocacy effort in Fort Worth clearly was the fight in the 1980s against the Department of Transportation's plan to expand the I-30 overhead above Lancaster Avenue in downtown Fort Worth. A broad-based group led by local leaders, including Robert M. Bass, Ruth Carter Stevenson, and Congresswoman Kay Granger worked with the legal department of the National Trust for Historic Preservation to defeat the Department of Transportation's planned expansion. The expansion would have come frighteningly close to Fort Worth's Beaux-Arts Post Office building and diminished the development for the post office, the TNP terminal, and the TNP warehouse. After thousands of people joined the citizens advocacy group known as iCare, a lawsuit was filed against the Department of Transportation, which iCare eventually won. The freeway was rerouted to the south and the overhead was demolished in 1990. The most recent comprehensive preservation effort started in the early 2000s to develop a citywide preservation plan that was finalized in 2003. The planning included the preservation and business communities and was led by the city of Fort Worth with a Memphis-based consulting group called Looney Rick's Kiss. The result was a 134 page document featuring a composite history of Fort Worth's preservation efforts, the economic opportunities that are inherent with historic designation and a plan on how to capitalize on those assets and opportunities. Um, and then now we're gonna switch into a little bit about local historic districts. And um, so here we go. Um, a local historic district is a tangible storybook about culture, architectural styles, building materials, craftsmanship, street patterns, and all of that and more. Typically, the, typically these distinct neighborhoods would not be affordable if built new. They combine into a magnetic collection of pedestrian friendly intersections that enhance local businesses and attract tourists. Additionally, they tap into the city of Fort Worth's economic incentive for appropriate rehabilitation of personal property. A 10 year savings on the city's portion of your property tax bill for projects approved in advance by the city's preservation staff. As the ultimate team sport, historic districts provide social and psychological benefits. Working together on common design goals and solutions makes for fast friends. 
all within walking distance of each other. Additionally, preservation appeals to those who care about the environment because demolished houses go into the landfill, unlike restored ones. Local districts give each property owner within the district the power of predictability, and that is a big power. For instance, historic districts keep your neighbor's house from changing so radically that it harms your personal property rights. If you live in a historic district, your neighborhood will not be able to build, your neighbor will not be able to build an addition that is too tall for your property, are too close to your property, are too near the street, are, are so your, your uh are so inappropriate for your neighborhood that your property values are harmed. To put it another way, historic districts keep others from shadowing your house and lawn, from obstructing your view as you try to back out of your driveway, and from building something that is totally incompatible with your neighborhood. Um, and now we're gonna go into the next great marriage of private property ownership and government. And it's about preservation tax credits that our state of Texas offers for anyone in Texas who qualifies. And that can be a nonprofit charity like Historic Fort Worth or any commercial use building, you commercial owner with a commercial use building. Um, and this all transpired on January 1 of 2015, our Texas legislature enable the first state tax credit for certified rehab projects in Texas. The 25% credit is among the highest value tax credit program in the country for corporate and nonprofit owners of buildings listed in the National Register of Historic Places, places or designated recorded historic landmarks since we're in Texas. The tax credit process is divided sequentially into three stages. Each must be followed precisely, and the tax credit staff at the Texas Historical Commission are most helpful. Also helpful is a project architect with experience in tax credit projects, and additionally, private consultants are available to assist with the entire process should you choose that route. Historic Fort Worth's first tax credit project began in 2017 at Thistle Hill, for an accessibility project requiring a 57 foot long concrete ramp to reach the height of the front porch terrace, which is 42 inches above grade. Early in the project, the Texas Historical Commission was informed that this would be a tax credit project. The ADA, the ADA project plan was approved and the required documentation was submitted over a span of almost two years. A public auditor was hired to review the project payments and income, and at the end of the process, a tax credit consulting firm was hired to, buy the, buy, to find the buyer for historic Fort Worth $71,000 in tax credits for that project, and the buyer turned out to be none other than a woman-owned tractor company in Tennessee. We women are sticking together. Historic Fort Worth is now restoring the front porch terrace at Thistle Hill, a 1,500 square foot structure. John Voltz is an, our architect and has been our architect for, since 1978. And Phoenix One Restoration and Construction is implementing this project at a cost of a little over $700,000. This project should generate around $175,000 in tax credits before auditor and agent fees. You can see it's, there's really an incentive to work with our state tax credits. This project should generate, okay, we did that. Historic Fort Worth has now completed phase one of the part three process for the front porch restoration. Simultaneously, Historic Fort Worth is starting another ADA project and tax credit project at our headquarters McFarland House. Sandstone from the quarry has been secured and shop drawings are underway for the project that includes a mechanical lift, adaptations to restrooms for compliance with the Americans with Disability Act. Throughout the state of Texas, corporate and nonprofit entities, including churches, are utilizing the state's historic tax credit program to make projects work and to hire artisans and craftsmen for the higher paying jobs these projects generate. 
Locally, the owners of businesses on South Main Street are revitalizing that area because of the value added by our state tax credit. Between 2015, when our state tax credit began, and 2020, the state tax credit program has assisted developers of 243 projects, resulting in investments of over $2.6 billion in historic buildings across the state. Certified tax credit projects have helped support more than 54,000 jobs in Texas with over $3.2 billion in wages and income. About $54.9 million has been generated in state sales taxes and $181.6 million in local taxes, not accounting for subsequent property tax increases. And over $4 billion has been added to the state's gross domestic product. Access to these tax credits and other preservation funds is enhanced by the city's participation in the certified local government program that Justin just told you about. Okay, you're up, I think, next, Justin. Yep, um, and while we're on the subject of preservation incentives, um, I'll touch a little bit on the historic site tax exemption program, which is our uh, local exemption here in the city of Fort Worth. The historic site tax exemption encourages substantial rehabilitation of designated properties and it offers a 10-year tax freeze um, for undertaking a rehabilitation project. We um, recently streamlined and updated the program in 2018 after an audit and in conjunction with um, a, an update of uh, Fort Worth's preservation ordinance. The tax exemption has encouraged over $621 million in investment in uh, historic properties in Fort Worth since 2015. So it's been a great economic gener generator for local jobs, um, and local wages, and um, saving local buildings here in the city. Um, it promotes best preservation practices um, because you can only get the financial incentive if the project meets all of the um, uh, preservation and design guidelines that have to be followed in historic districts or for individually designated properties. And our local exemption can be paired with the state and federal tax exemption to maximize the return on investment um, and uh, recouping of your project costs. So as an example, um, what you see here on the screen is the Meisner Brown Funeral Home, uh, which is a local uh, building on Fort Worth's east side close to Texas Wesleyan University. Um, this project took advantage of local, state, and preservation tax incentives to save this landmark. Um, Jerry and Historic Fort Worth were very instrumental in finding a buyer to save this. It was literally about to fall down um, onto the neighboring property, and um, they ended up finding uh, Phoenix One, or the owner of Phoenix One, to come in and rehab the building. And you can see in the top image there, that's the finished product. Um, they've turned the old funeral home and mortuary into an event space um, and potential office space. So it's been a great use of tax incentives in the city, and um, we're we're glad to see that uh, back operating as a as a community hub on, in that area of Fort Worth. Okay. Um, well, we're going to move on to a real success story, and it's Fairmount, our neighborhood on the near south side, um, which happens to be one of 14 historic districts in our city, but it's the largest district, not only in our city, but in the southwestern United States. So those who live in Fairmount are the city's most enthusiastic keepers of more than 1,000 bungalows, four square homes, and other resources from the late 1800s to the 1920s. Their leadership not only protects their neighborhood, but it influences those who live in other historic districts because they do it so well. They're great teachers. Fairmount was one of Fort Worth's worst neighborhoods to live in in the 1970s and 80s. The poorly maintained neighborhood led to crime, extremely deferred maintenance, and lots of stray animals. 
However, concerned citizens who want to protect the wanted to protect the neighborhood led the charge for Fairmount to become a national register historic district and a local historic districts. Both districts were established in 1991. The Fairmount Neighborhood Association emerged to perpetuate the strong preservation ethic of Fairmount. This is demonstrated by the Neighborhood Association's commitment to helping new neighbors understand their design guidelines by the detailed and instructive information on their website and by their monitoring of cases before the City of Fort Worth's Historic and Cultural Landmark Commission. They are meticulous about managing what happens in their neighborhood. Fairmount residents have utilized the city's historic site tax exemption and, preser and preservation's best practices for over 30 years. The result of their methodical practice is the revitalization of their neighborhood, making it one of Fort Worth's most desirable zip codes in which to live. Their savvy tutelage even instruct those who live in other historic districts. And now we're going to transition to design districts in Fort Worth, um, which work hand in hand with our historic districts. They're just um, a, a little different flavor and they operate slightly differently than uh, what than the way historic districts operate. Um, so a design district is essentially um, an area that has a um, to um, regulate new construction and um, public infrastructure projects in between um, buildings to create a pedestrian friendly environment to live, work, and play. Um, this image you see on the, on the screen is of South Main Street here in Fort Worth. It's just south of downtown. Um, it's within the near south side form based code district, which was established in the 1990s, shortly after the Fairmount Historic District. Um, both these those districts are ad adjacent to each other and they were created to respond to deteriorating conditions on the ground that Jerry mentioned earlier. The goal of um, design districts and especially in the near south side was to revitalize uh, a commercial district between downtown and inner ring neighborhoods while creating jobs, promoting small businesses and revitalizing not long neglected commercial buildings. Um, the push to create these form-based code districts was led by community leaders, business owners, and local residents in partnership with the city. Um, city staff provided most of the technical knowledge on how to achieve community goals through design guidelines. Um, and shortly after the near south side district was created in the 1990s, the downtown design district was also created um, to kind of help revitalize Fort Worth's downtown, um, which wasn't in the best shape during that time period. Um, you can see here a lot of the elements in this image um, on the streetscape were required by the form-based code district standards and guidelines, um, such as the street trees, the wide sidewalks, the um, bump outs and parallel parking. All of these things create a very safe, comfortable, pedestrian friendly environment that encourages business development and activity along South Main Street. Uh, one of the greatest successes in Fort Worth of a design district and a historic district coming together is Magnolia Avenue, which you can see here on uh, in both pictures. Um, Magnolia Avenue is the historic commercial corridor on the north side of Fairmount and the south side of the near south um, south side district. Um, it's been the, a commercial corridor for over a hundred years. Um, and in the 1990s, it was in need of a lot of um, TLC. Um, and so the, between the form-based code district and the um, historic district standards and guidelines, um, business owners and property owners and local residents were able to help reinvigorate this historic pedestrian friendly corridor using best practice urban design principles. Um, the, Near Southside Form Based Code District really has guided new development and new construction on, on the north side or on the left side of this, this streetscape image you see here. And um, the city and local residents have partnered with another local nonprofit called Near Southside Inc. 
which has kind of been the guiding force for bringing development into the area, for educating property owners on how to design a project to meet the district guidelines. And they've also been the ones who have been real, have been the best educators um, within that area. And so um, between the district guidelines and near South Side Inc. and the historic district standards and guidelines, Magnolia um, Avenue has really seen a resurgence and it is one of the destination places to visit when you're here in Fort Worth. I just wanted to make you all aware that you have about five minutes left. All right, I will go quickly through the rest of these slides. Um, so design districts help retain community character. Um, this is Camp Bowie Boulevard, which is our uh, a historic highway, um, part of the original interstate highway system in, in Fort Worth. And um, there is a form-based code district here that helps protect the original auto-oriented um, uh, streetscape and contextual um, neighborhood elements in that area. Form-based code districts um, guide compatible new development. They create predictable development and they give the community a voice in land use and development decisions within those districts. Um, so citizens can, or, um, can really participate through these local nonprofits that help um, uh, push forward design and business development within the design districts. Um, design districts also encourage excellent design of public spaces. And here on this slide, you'll see some different components of a pedestrian friendly streetscape. So you have a wide sidewalk um, in between a building and a uh, sh um, usually a landscaping strip with trees or grass. In this instance, there's um, bicycle racks, places to, to sit and relax, um, and you have parallel parking usually defined by bump outs at the end of each block. And so a lot of what form-based code districts and design guidelines do here in Fort Worth is to create a um, very um, pedestrian friendly and positive environment in between buildings, which creates um, uh, uh, standardized development procedures for developers on the ground. Um, this photo here is of Mule Alley in the stockyards. Um, Mule Alley and the horse and mule barns um, were recently rehabilitated. We've worked closely as a city with the developer um, and local business interests and private owners in the stockyards to um, really create a contextually sensitive um, design solution for a streetscape that uh, was essentially a parking lot two years ago. Um, so if you ever come to Fort Worth, this is the place to go to now. Um, it's full of shops and restaurants, uh, bars and breweries, um, and it's really turning into the new economic and cultural hub in the stockyards and on the north side of Fort Worth. Um, briefly, I'll touch on TIFs, with our, which are tax increment financing districts. We have several TIFs throughout Fort Worth that um, generally follow the same boundaries of our design districts. Um, basically, what TIFs do is take the increase in property value from year one of, um, of the founding of the TIF and takes the increase in tax dollars and reinvests those tax dollars within the district itself for public infrastructure improvements. So here you were back on South Main Street and in the near south side. TIF dollars have been used to upgrade um, most of the 120-year-old infrastructure beneath the streets um, at no cost to the uh, local property owners. So this really helps spur and drive development because if infrastructure projects and financing are covered by a TIF district, then developers can spend more money on rehabbing their buildings and getting their businesses up and running. And Justin, I apologize, I have the wrong time. It's 4.45, not 4.15. Okay. Well, no, um, no, we can scare you, but... That's all right. Um, so wrapping up, um, preservation and design districts go hand in hand and are not mutually exclusive, especially here in Fort Worth. They've worked together um, for decades to revitalize um, important commercial corridors and neighborhoods throughout our city. 
both types of districts work together towards the same goal, which is an activated urban environment that creates great places um, for folks to live, work, and play close to their homes. Um, historic preservation, community advocacy, and design districts um, all grew out of grassroots community efforts as a way for um, local citizens to guide development and have a voice in the growth and revitalization of their city and their neighborhoods um, and their commercial districts. Um, we hope that the tools and the examples we've provided today um, that Fort Worth has used over the past 30 to 40 years are, are helpful to you. Um, they've been helpful for us and we're continuing to utilize them today as, as we move forward um, and and to continue to grow and redevelop as a city. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. Um, Ruth, we're, I guess we're ready for questions. We do have a couple of questions. Um, early on in the presentation, you mentioned an app for collecting data. Um, what is the name of the app or is that, is it an app that you will customize for your city? That survey collector tool is a customizable tool um, that our consultant created in ArcGIS. And so it's very similar to um, the Arches platform that was developed by the Getty Institute. It's supposed to be an open source app um, and it will tie in to our existing ArcGIS and zoning platform on the city's website. Um, thank you. And then a comment um, when you were talking about the building um, in Poly, someone said that's a beautiful building. I'm glad you were able to reuse it as a community hub. And the next question is, um, has Fort Worth had to deal with scooter rentals, agency pop-ups, entrepreneurs trying to set up shop on of ways? No, we, um, unlike our neighbors to the east in Dallas, we didn't allow them so we did not have any of those issues um, that any of other large cities did. Um, how is a TIF different from a PID? They sound the same. Um, they, they are very similar. And uh, to be honest, Laura would know better um, and have a better answer to this question than I would. She's our um, design district and kind of TIF czar. Um, so, uh, I will, I will a ask her what the answer is to that question and, um, send it to Ruth and we can post it with the presentation. Perfect. Um, love Fort Worth and its architecture. How much did the tornado in the nineties affect revitalization? Jerry, do you want to take that well, one? I mean, I think we've really recovered fully from that as I see it. We got a great sculpture out of it, some twisted metal that it became a sculpture right at a key intersection. But, you know, the building it hit the most has, has become residential and it was office building and uh, before that and a big restaurant at the top of it. And it's done well as a residential building. It, it certainly knocked, all puns intended, the wind out of Fort Worth sales for some time to try to figure out what to do with this big building. But, but everybody's pretty well recovered. Most of the buildings were insured downtown. They're just, it, it's taken some time, but I don't think you would be aware at all of a tornado going through part of downtown today. Okay, and just a lot of kudos. Um, awesome presentation, great information. Thank you. Um, can wait a few minutes to see if there's anything else that comes through. But I just wanted to point out that a lot of the locations that um, Justin and Jerry point, pointed out are going to be featured in our neighborhood board. So I think that it, not, it ties together nicely. So that's really cool. Yeah. And um, just to point out, um, this is what Mule Alley used to look like before it uh, was revitalized to look like this. So um, you can see we've come a long way in Fort Worth since the 1920s. That's a really 
picture. I like to see all the historical and differences and the before and after pictures. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions come in, so I just wanted to thank you, Justin, and thank you, Jerry, for taking time out of your day to come and present at NUSA. Um, we, let me see, we just have something, we just had one pop in. Um, actually, they're all coming in now, so I take my thank yous back and I'll, I'll put them on hold for you. <laughs> are we allowed to replace windows um, that are single panes with more energy efficient windows? And I'm guessing this is for historical um, overlays. Um, well, the, the thing you need to first figure out is if the window can be repaired. Um, and if it can, you should repair it first because an old growth timber wood window um, in a historic building will last another hundred years with simple repair techniques. Um, and it, they're actually more, a repaired wood window is the most energy efficient window on the market. There are ways to retrofit them to um, install double paned insulated glass. Um, and so that's what we typically recommend just so you can get the full benefit of a repaired restored window. Um, if you if you have to if you can't repair a wood window and you have to replace it, it's uh, totally fine to replace it in kind with a new wood window that has double or triple pane glass. Um, you know we always encourage you to check with our office first before embarking on a project so we can provide guidance on these types of things. Hi Maria, do you ask, um, how does the neighborhood find out if they can do revitalization? Through a historic district, um, is that uh, if that's the question, then the neighbors need to get together and work with the city on um, how to develop a historic district. Um, it it's it's a clear process. Do you want to talk any about it since it's your program, Justin? Um, I, I would say um, the best way to figure out it. A neighborhood, can, a neighborhood can do it as if the uh, residents want to do it. You know, all of our historic districts here were led by the people who live in the, in the neighborhoods. And so um, if you guys are up for it, we are here to help out and provide all the technical guidance and knowledge on how to make that happen. There, um where Anna is from, and that might be helpful if it's a new initiative that she's starting in her own city or within, you know, um, a different state. That may, it may be something that they already have um, set in place, so just calling your, your city to find out as well. Yeah. Um, where did the public finance infrastructure generate? Um, and, and talk about this, unfortunately, she couldn't make it today. Um, but I will find out that information. And if you want to email me, I can um, get you her contact information and we can provide more information on how um, public infrastructure districts uh, operate. How was it? Uh, the question should have been, how was it generated? Don't know if that makes a difference of on you being able to answer that question. It does not. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> well, um, you can find Justin's and Jerry's contact information by clicking on their picture next to um, the workshop description, and they'd be happy to get those answers for you, or you can leave them in the chat, and um, they can follow up, and I can get back to you. Thank you again, Justin and Jerry, uh, for joining us today. I hope to see you at the neighborhood tours. And if you don't, don't join us for that, we'll see you again tomorrow for the other uh, workshop sessions. Thanks so Thanks much. Everyone. Thank you.